All right, Alexander, let's just jump right into it. Everyone that's watching us on Rumble, you'll find the button up top. It'll take you to our Locals page, little red button. Click on that. You'll get into our Locals community. And uh, Alexander, let's uh, get into the big story, which is obviously the uh, recognition of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Yeah. And I just want to tell all our viewers in this video, we'll talk about the, this, uh, this big news. And uh, in the second part of the video, yeah. we'll answer a lot of the questions from our live stream that we did. And I'll yes. try to get everything up by tonight, Tuesday evening or Wednesday evening. So just yes. keep a lookout for two, a two-part video, one with our discussion, the second part going over all, going over all of the, the questions that we had. So Alexander, my first um, question comment to you is, as we talked about the mainstream media in the uh, West is doing damage control for Biden. The headline is pretty much across the board is Russia invades Ukraine. Yeah. You know exactly how they're framing this by <laughs> saying it's an invasion. Exactly? Is this an invasion? Well, as a U.S. official, the State Department official apparently said um, the, there are Russian troops now entering the two republics of the Donbass, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. And, of course, the United States and the Western powers have always been insisting that they have always already been there. Now, of course, Russia has denied it. But if you follow the logic of what the Western powers are saying, then all that has happened is that Russian troops that are in present in the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics are now there openly, where before they were there covertly. So it, it, it's not an invasion. It's nothing like an invasion. What has happened, and I, this is my own take on this, but i quite clear, listening to the Russian debates, reading Putin's speech, which has been completely misrepresented, by the way, um, that so far from this move being intended as preparatory for an invasion, it was done to prevent a war. <laughs> there was shelling and attacking on the Donbass. I mean, I you know, let's not get into the weeds about who was shelling whom and what happened in particular incidents. I'm not interested in all of that. The OSCE and the Red Cross have said clearly that there was a major up uptick in fighting. Things were getting extremely uh, dangerous. Um, it looked as if this whole thing was easily going to spiral out of control into a violent confront military confrontation. The Russians have repeatedly said, they've been saying this not for, for you know at, at least a year, longer in fact, that if there was a Ukrainian attack on the Donbass, Russia would intervene. It would not allow Donbass to be rolled over by by Ukraine by force. So what the Russians did was that they recognized the two republics, put their troops in to prevent that attack on the two republics of the Donbass, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, which might have resulted as a result of this escalation in the fighting there, and which could have easily led to a much wider war. So this is an act to destabilize what was already becoming an extremely tense and very dangerous situation. Now, it has not absolutely certain at the moment that that's worked. There's still some shelling going on, apparently, though on a much reduced scale. And there's been talk that there was been still some people, I mean, the, the, the people on the Donetsk Republic are still claiming that there's still sabotage groups trying to infiltrate in, though no doubt they will be dealt with. But so it's not absolutely certain that's worked yet, but I think more likely than not, it will be. And thereafter, I think this situation will calm, or at least I think that is what the Russians want to see happen. They're not interested in attacking Kiev. They're not interested in all-out war in Ukraine. They don't want an all-out invasion of Ukraine. And I think that, as I said, they've acted in effect to contain the situation, confine it to what was, I'm not sure we can call it that any longer, what was eastern Ukraine, and to make sure that this thing doesn't escalate beyond the point which it has already reached. That's my take of the position. 
Right. Re- real quick, just a follow up question. I mean, Russia recognizes Donetsk yeah. and Lugansk yes. as independent countries. Yes. Yes. They were then invited to act as peacekeepers to stabilize the situation. Yeah. Yes. That that's a correct account. It wasn't. Russia is not planning, at least in, for now. No. They're not. They haven't um, annexed Donetsk and Lugansk, like the media no. is also reporting. This is no, fake they, news that they're reporting. No, it's, it's fake they news. haven't annexed those republics. They haven't incorporated them into the Russian Federation. What no. has happened is they recognize them, and yes. then those republics invited them to step in. Under Absolutely. international law, That's they're standing on very firm ground. Well, I would say they were actually. Now I know you're going to get lots from, of lots from the of Russian people. side. From the from Russian, Russian side, I'm not, side. Know, everybody's no, yeah, getting, everybody else side, is getting yeah. is going to disagree. But you know, I, I come back to what happened with Kosovo. I mean, Kosovo was a province, uh, uh, a region of, of of Yugoslavia, a region of Serbia. There was all sorts of talk of uh, you know all kinds of genocides and violence happening in Kosovo. The United States and its allies in NATO attacked Yugoslavia, bombed the country. Uh, um, that led to a U.S. military occupation of Kosovo. There was a Security Council resolution, however, which the U.S. and Britain and France voted for, which reaffirmed that Kosovo was still a part of, an integral part of Yugoslavia and of Serbia. Then a few years later, the United States and its allies recognized Kosovo's independence, saying that this was a legitimate exercise of self-determination. The issue then went to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, and the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that there had been no violation of international law because in these kind of circumstances, um, when a population wants to secede from a country, the issue is not, uh, um, you know, juridical. Do they have a, a legal right within according to the laws of that country, to secede from it. It is, do they have a factual claim which is effective to secede? And the example that was given was of the American colonists, which managed to break away from Britain, uh, um, from the British Empire through their War of Independence. You can read it all in the massive advisory opinion on Kosovo, which was provided by the International Court of Justice, um, at very much the instigation of the United States and the Western powers. On issues related to Ukraine, the Western powers prefer to ignore it. Yeah, and we can't forget that what uh, what the United States and NATO did in Kosovo was Absolutely. to build a massive base as well, yeah. a military Absolutely. base as well. Well, indeed. Well, indeed. Which on is top of, of, what, on top of the is, recognition. <laughs> indeed, which is, of course, what the Russians are doing also in Donbass. Let's not be naive about this thing. There will be Russian military bases in Donbass. Uh, um, and, of course, the U.S. did this in Kosovo too. The difference, I suspect, is that in Kosovo, acquiring that base was probably the entire purpose of the whole exercise. Whereas in Donbass, it's a product of this exercise in the sense that, as I said, the actions of the Russians, I think, are intended to prevent a wider war. But establishing a base in Donbass is a guarantee or is hoped to be a guarantee that a Ukrainian attack leading to a further war won't happen. Okay, so um, the Biden White House, the Biden administration, from Biden to Saki to Sullivan to Blinken, uh, the EU leaders from van der Leyen to Macron to uh, Michel, uh, in the UK, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, uh, in Germany, uh, Schultz, all of them are saying that this is unprecedented, that uh, they have never seen a country uh, in Europe change another country's borders in the manner that Russia has and that they will respond with swift and painful sanctions. And uh, they're saying that this is is something they can never let happen ever again and should never have happened. In other words, this is so unique and so unprecedented. uh, The leaders of Europe and the United States can't believe what they are witnessing. Um, And they're going to place sanctions on Russia. Of course, they were going to place sanctions either way, but we'll get into that as well. We'll get into that as well. So my, 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 my question to you is, once again, a kind of historical question. How come... Since 1974, when Turkey 
invaded Cyprus, took 36% of Cypriot land, displaced the people of Cyprus, in other words, kicked them off of their land and continued to occupy uh, Cyprus illegally. Um, they have not been sanctioned. As a matter of fact, they have been coddled and actually given money. Um, most recently, in the past couple of years, they've been given money by the European Union. How come uh, Turkey in this way is treated um, in, in one way and Russia is treated in another? Uh- and Turkey, of course, also remains a member of NATO. <laughs> um, why, why is Turkey diff- treated differently? Because it is a U.S. ally, or has been a U.S. ally. And that's, it, that is the entire reason. I mean, th- there is nothing unprecedented about this. It has happened several times in Europe previously. It happened, uh, it happened obviously, in Yugoslavia. I've just discussed the whole Kosovo situation. And of course, it happened, as you know, personally, because you live in Cyprus and you experienced it. So it's happened in Cyprus, too. This is not new. I mean, there is nothing unprecedented about this. And what the Russians have done is a product. I have to say this of the fragility of the Ukrainian state, its failure to cohere and the fact that as a result, there's been a progressive breakdown are uh, uh, within the Ukrainian state, something that Putin, by the way, discussed at great length in his address yesterday, but which, of course, Western governments simply refuse to stop their ears about. They don't want to consider it. So th- this is why this is why this has happened. And can I also say it's the product of a total failure of diplomacy, because there was a pathway to peace, which was agreed in February 2015, which is the Minsk agreement, which could have reunited Ukraine, or at least in theory. But it never did because Ukraine refused to abide by its terms and the Western powers allowed it to. So you know, this situation has been created by many actors. First and foremost, I have to say this, by people within Ukraine itself, but also with the involvement of outside powers, including the Western powers. It's not unprecedented. It is a byproduct of the changes, however, of of the failure of the Western powers to understand or be responsive to Russian security and national concerns. Yeah. I also just want to say that uh, in the case of Cyprus, it was an invasion by Turkey and, uh, and an annexation in a way um, where in Lugansk and Donetsk, what you have is two breakaway republics yeah. in being recognized and then inviting the uh, the Russian Federation well, yes. Well, yes. To, uh, well, to come in. So very different scenarios. Uh, oh, another absolutely. very quick question, then we'll get into then we'll get into Minsk and the sanctions and all of this stuff um, in Syria. The Syrian government invited Russia in yes. to uh, take care of IS. Yes. The U.S. continues to occupy a part More of Syria it. not invited. How is that uh, different? Well, it's not different. It's exactly the same. But one of the most pernicious things, and uh, and I really have to say that I'm beginning to get really exasperated about this, and I'm sure there's lots of people around the world who are talking about this, is that there's this attempt that the Western powers are making to differentiate Europe, what goes on in Europe and what goes on there, what happens there from everywhere else in the world. So that supposedly wars, crises in Europe are unacceptable. They must all follow the logic of you know, the EU and Brussels and Washington and London and all these places. Um, but, you know, if there's a crisis in, you know, Yemen or a crisis in Syria or a crisis in Iraq, well, these are, let's face straightforward about this, these are sort of savage, violent, um, uncivilized countries. And, you know, one can't compare them which, with what goes on in the civilized region of Europe. I personally find that extremely uh, condescending. And, of course, violence, brutality, cruelty, war are the same in any part of the world. And that, of course, includes Europe. Yeah. OK, so um, we got that out of the way. I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on, on the hypocrisy that we're seeing. Um, the Minsk agreements, the Minsk protocols, eight years, they were never implemented. Were they ever going to be implemented? 
And uh, do you believe that Macron's phone calls with Putin was Macron maybe trying to sell Putin on the fact that I can get it done. I'll I'll get yeah. the Minsk protocols implemented. Just give me a couple more days, of which Macron failed to to do it, and Putin knew he was going to fail doing it. This has been discussed at extraordinary length in that Security Council meeting in Moscow. And one of the purposes of that Security Council meeting in Moscow was to educate the Russian public, to inform the Russian public about what was happening. But before I go into that, can I just make a point that it's very interesting that suddenly I've seen one of the same people in the media, I mean, various people who write for the Daily Telegraph, specifically, for example, the Financial Times, the Guardian, all the rest, people who were saying that implementing the Minsk Agreement would be a contravention of Ukrainian sovereignty, that it was appeasement of Russia to have Ukraine actually abide by the terms of the Minsk Agreement. The same people are now suddenly discovering that the uh, uh, Minsk Agreement is this holy text, which Russia has supposedly violated, and that it's you know, something that Russia should be blamed for. So they look one way when Ukraine refuses to implement it. They look the other, they, they, they suddenly become full of indignation when the Russians say, well, this thing is exhausted. It's become a ghost. It's not ever going to happen. Now, let's get to Macron, because the Russians discussed this, what happened with Macron over um, the course of uh, this Security Council meeting. And they went over Putin's discussions with Macron, which had been incredibly extensive. They went on for hours over the weekend. And Macron came along with all kinds of ideas. But every time, apparently, that Putin tried to pin him down, saying to him, look, you know, you say that we're going to have a Normandy fall. Does this mean that Ukraine is prepared to sit down and talk with the leaders of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics as it is required to do by the Minsk Agreement. Um, um, Macron so, evaded. He, he, would, he wasn't able in the end to say. And the same was true of everything else. I mean, he was... Uh, uh, Putin apparently asked him directly, you know, are, 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 about NATO enlargement. And Macron said to him, well, you know, the Americans are... Uh, considering shifting their position. And Putin said, well, you know, how are the Americans shifting their position? And again, Macron wasn't able to say. So, yes, I think Macron tried <laughs> to talk to the Russians. He tried to sort of avert this. But, of course, what the Russians concluded, and I'm sure they were absolutely right, is that if they'd agreed with what Macron had done, if they'd been delayed further a few days, a few weeks things would have gone back to how they were always. Ukraine setting up this meeting, having meetings in under the Normandy for format, and then saying that they're not prepared to do any of the things that the Minsk Agreement requires them to do. The United States quietly backing in them in all of this. The Germans unwilling to exert any pressure, and France unwilling to exert any pressure either, because they're hobbled by what the Germans were doing. So I think the, the, the Russians heard and listened to Macron very politely. But I think they came to the conclusion that he wasn't coming to them with anything new. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't going to be able to uh, to implement anything in uh, no. in essence. Um, okay, so Nord Stream two was was cancelled. They, they stopped it. <laughs> just, uh, just, just this was expected. Just, just as we yeah. said. I mean, I, I you know, we yeah. said this yesterday so, in our program, and we, we've been talking yeah. about this for several days. I mean, to my mind, this is a central element. This was going to happen either way. I mean, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Go yeah. on, go on. You're saying, uh, and, and as I said, I mean, it's what, in my opinion, this whole thing has to a great extent been all about. I mean, the United States was not going to allow Nord Stream 2 to finish. I mean, that was baked in the cake. And um, the big loser, which we'll come to, I'm sure, in a moment, is Germany, because Germany needs Nord Stream 2. But these very provincial and uh, uh, run-of-the-mill politicians in Germany, including, by the way, Angela Merkel, for all her serpentine skills. They thought that they could run with a hair 
and with the hounds, as we say in Britain. They thought that they could have Nord Stream 2 and at the same time spin Minsk along indefinitely uh, um, so as not to um, upset the Americans. And what they've discovered is that they've not got Minsk and they've not got Nord Stream 2, which is exactly what happens when you try and play that kind of game. A strong German government would have said to the Americans and to the Ukrainians, relations with, the, with Russia are in Germany's national interests. We have to have Nord Stream 2. We've got to find some way of plugging this gap in our energy supplies. There is no other cost-effective way to do it. We have to have, therefore, a good relationship with Russia, or at least a stable relationship with Russia. And that means we have to settle the conflict in Ukraine. And the way to do that is via Minsk. Is via Minsk. But of course, the Germans weren't prepared to do that. They thought, as I said, that they could play along with both the hare and the hounds. And now, of course, they found that they can't. Right. So uh, just to summarize what the media spin is going to be, the damage control, what it's going to be, it's going to be, you see, Russia really did invade Ukraine. That's going to be the first uh, media lie. Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, Russia never abided by the Minsk protocol. In yep. other words, they broke. They broke the terms of the Minsk protocol. Yes. And... We put our foot down and we said enough is enough. And thus we are canceling mm. Nord Stream 2, yeah. which Russia desperately needs. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and, and that's it. That's, yeah. that's, well, well, the, that uh, that's going to that, be the that spin, is, that, right? That is yeah. what they're going to say. I'm going to make a quick observation now because we're, we're in a changing situation all the time. But of course... Uh, just go back and read all those headlines and all those comments and claims and assertions that we've been getting over the last couple of months about, you know, the Russian army marching on Kiev, sacking Kiev, rounding up Ukrainians and, you know, having kill lists, all, all, all this lurid stuff. If the Russian military remains within the Donbass, the, the areas of the Donbass, then, of course, all of that will have been proved wrong. <laughs> and given that that is what I expect is going to happen, or at least what the Russians, I think, are intending to do, I think we will see, before very long, that it will be proved wrong. So far from it being proved right, it has been proved wrong. There is a massive discordance between what was said the Russians would do and what the Russians have actually done. There is, in fact, such a massive discordance that it's not really possible, it seems to me, to reconcile the two or to argue convincingly um, outside the sort of media space that uh, uh, this is, in fact, the Russian invasion which we've been hearing about and waiting for all of this time. So that is the first thing. The second is that, you know, for all the bloviating, for all the uh, you know, windy rhetoric, for all the... Uh, um, sanctions which we are about to see and the word at the moment and you know we'll just have to wait and see what those sanctions are going to amount to that apparently they're being they're not going to be the full sanctions I mean what Nord Stream 2 is cancelled but in all other respects it doesn't look as if they're going to be the full range of sanctions we've been hearing about well other than that <laughs> it seems that Blinken and Lavrov are still intending to meet on Thursday now, that may change, but if that is true, then again, that is very inconsistent with some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing over the last few days. Yeah. Okay. So here's uh, a thought that I had today. Um, Nord Stream 2 has been put on ice. Midterm elections are coming in, uh, yeah. in a few months. Uh, Biden's Biden and the media, they're going to play up Nord Stream 2 because, you know, I think Nord Stream 2 is something that a lot of people, you know, uh, in the West can kind of understand and get a, and get a handle on and, and they'll play it up like, you know, Biden was the strong guy that canceled it. Trump was the guy that couldn't stop it, but Biden was the guy that could stop it. And they'll play it up and people are all... They'll fall for the, the the narrative of, you know, Putin really needed the gas to get to Europe yep. and now we've stopped them. And 
you know, Biden is is a strong man and, and he stood up to Putin. So, I mean, that'll be how they spin it. That's fine. I think the Russians know that as well and they don't have a problem with it. But my question to you is, uh, and one of the thoughts that I had is, given the dynamics of uh, the U.S. political landscape and how it's going to be changing in a matter of months and come 2024, it, it'll probably change a lot. Uh, given that you're going to have that going on, given that you're going to have the pipeline, the transit in Ukraine winding down in 2023, Absolutely. 2024 as well. Would it be a fair assessment to say that Germany and the Russians may both be saying, I'm not saying they agree to this, I'm just saying they, they may be thinking, you know what, let's put Nord Stream 2 on ice, it's there, yeah. let's yeah. put it on ice, let's yeah. say we canceled yeah. it, but maybe in a year or two or three, as Ukraine's transit winds down, as the U.S. political landscape changes, we can revisit it and reopen it. And as, of course, Germany starts feeling a lot of pain from the cancellation of Nord Stream 2, it, specifically not the people. The German government doesn't care about the the, uh, the German people or the EU citizens paying more. The, the industries, the businesses, as Absolutely. they really start to feel it bite. Maybe they can revisit it in 2023, say. Well, it may be because I don't think this is going to end in Germany, by the way. I mean, I think this is issue is going to now start become a really difficult topic because, again, if the Russians stop in the Donbass where they are and energy prices start to rise, which they will. Can I just say it's completely neglected, but there's been reports over the last few days that there's practically no gas left in uh, um, Europe's. Um, gas, underground gas storage system. There's practically no gas left. And the liquefied natural gas terminals are absolutely saturated. They can't process anymore. So, um, uh, and, you know, we've had a mild winter, and that shows you how precarious the whole situation is we're now going to have a very difficult summer and you need gas also remember to create fertilizer you need all kinds of things like that and then of course when we start next winter which may be a lot colder we never know can't be sure then of course things could turn very grim indeed so i i, I suspect that there will be this issue of Nord Stream 2 reactivating Nord Stream 2 will at some stage be resurrected. I'm not going to give a date on it. I mean, there's a massive head of street steam around it at the moment, and we'll just see how it goes and how it turns out. But it's possible. But it would require a German government, and either under immense pressure within Germany itself, or one that suddenly discovers its courage, and that might only happen if there is indeed a major change in policy and government in the United States as well. Which, by the way, is not impossible. I mean, can I just say, um, coming back to this big issue um, of the U.S.'s geopolitical challenges, the big U.S., the big geopolitical challenge to the U.S. is, is now the consensus in Washington, except amongst a small group of hardline neocons in the State Department who have been driving this policy, is that the U.S.'s great geopolitical challenge now is going to come from China. What is all this doing? Well, we had one Russian pipeline to China a few years ago. Before 2014, we had none. Now there's going to be three. <laughs> natural gas is going to start shifting. Russian natural gas is going to start pivoting to China. So this is going to accelerate and intensify. And it's possible that the US, a new US government, perhaps more, shall we say, um, grounded and more um, interested in facts than media messaging, will we'll see that this policy is actually going nowhere and is actually worsening the US's strategic position and will finally do what Donald Trump wanted to do way back in 2016, which is actually start talking to the Russians and to try to find some way of creating some kind of divide between them and the Chinese. The Chinese must be looking at all of this with quiet satisfaction. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Um, okay, so the... Uh 
the Biden White House took a very, very big loss, but the media will uh, provide a lot of damage control. And uh, I I think at the end of the day, this won't do that much damage to Biden because it's so it's so far Uh, away and distant. For, it's far uh, away in distance. Public. Exactly. I yeah. think they're interested in it, to be straightforward about it. I mean, yeah, I think. And the media it, will cover it up. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Americans in general, to be straightforward about this, are, are exhausted with foreign policy news. They're now going to be suffering higher especially energy with bills. <laughs> especially with Russia. They're going, to be hit, they're going to be faced with higher energy bills. I mean, uh, uh, oil is already at about $100 a barrel, and it's probably going to be higher. Um, so, uh, so you know, they're exhausted with, um, saturated with foreign policy news, and a, a, a president who seems to be more focused on foreign policy than dealing with bills, supply problems, all of those things within the United States, is going to lose support, not win it. That's my own personal view. Yeah, they felt they could get some sort of easy win with this, and boy, were they proven wrong. Well, and, and it, no hasn't, one even it hasn't about worked. The fact this, that, yeah, it hasn't worked. There's yeah, been no worked. bounce. There's been no bounce in the polls. <laughs> if, if that was the plan, if the plan was to you know project Biden as the new JFK, there's been no bounce in the polls, and I don't think there will be because I don't really think that this is a topic that affects the American people. Uh, I mean, they're not interested in Ukraine. It's a faraway country. Um, but they are interested in the fact that their household bills are rising. And if I can come to sanctions now, of course, the Russians will, will suffer. They will, they will have a hit by this. But Russians care about Ukraine. They care about Donbass. I know there's been a lot of people who've been talking about the fact that Putin talked at an inordinate length about the history uh, uh, um, in that broadcast that he made yesterday. And some um, British, especially British and American um, journalists have ridiculed all of this. But of course, Russians are interested in this history. They care about it. They're probably refreshed and, uh, 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 you know, uh, thankful that their leader is at last talking about these things in such a straightforward way. So they care about this and they will take an economic and lo- uh, hit because they care about Ukraine. Americans, Britons don't ultimately care about Ukraine or at least not to anything like the same degree. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. Um, the, uh, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, Okay, so Biden will have the media do damage control and okay, yeah. whatever. Um, I, I think people have already forgotten about about this in the United States. The EU are big losers, but um, you know the EU leaders aren't accountable to anybody. So no. you know they've been embarrassed. They've lost again. They've been they've been exposed as the uh, the the dumbbells that they are. Yeah. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day. You know, the EU has zero democratic uh, mechanisms and the van der Leyen's of the world and the Michelle's are accountable to no one. So so they're not going yeah. to, to care about this whatsoever either. Uh, let's get, though, to Ukraine, which yeah. uh, is the, the, the big, big loser. Oh, and by the way, this is what I wanted to say. By the way, a lot of people aren't talking about the fact that throughout this entire crisis, the Ukraine has been losing around three billion a month, while Russia has been making a ton of money from Absolutely. the uh, from the Absolutely. price of oil, which is at like a hundred, is going to probably Absolutely. go higher. So I mean, Absolutely. this has been one massive debacle. But talk about Ukraine. This is a a massive loss for Ukraine. I'm not talking about yeah. the land. Yeah. This this whole thing. Yeah, this this whole fiction and spectacle and debacle that Biden has led the Ukrainians into. Probably yeah. starting from 2014. Absolutely. God, Absolutely. whatever the guy touches turns to shit. I mean, he, th- th- this one man has single-handedly destroyed the country of Ukraine. But yeah. this this is just going to be terrible for uh, for Ukraine uh, going forward. A- a- and for a Absolutely. lot of the... Uh, you mentioned it at the live stream. The Russian speakers are going to be looking at this as well because Russia's going to build Lugansk and Donetsk up. I mean, yeah, it's going to make it into a nice place to live. Yes. Well, actually, yeah, absolutely. But can I just say, before I do that, can I just get on to Europe? Because I think Europe actually is also a massive loser in this affair. And when I say a massive loser, I think to an extent that European con- politicians, uh, of course, the people in Brussels are beyond redemption, but European politicians and indeed European electorates simply do not understand what Europe has just done is that it's 
rendered itself at a stroke uncompetitive. It, it can't now get proper gas. It's locked into a confrontation with Russia, which is going to drain resources and drain energy. We're going to see the processes of deindustrialization in Europe in accelerate and intensify in Germany too. We're going to see competition problems, uh, Europe becoming increasingly uncompetitive in world markets. We are living on the wealth of our extraordinary past and we're frittering it away. And we've just taken another huge step in that direction. Uh, Macron, to his credit, has some glimmers of understanding of this, though he's never, as I said, had the courage to see it through. But this has been a calamity for Europe, and it's going to, the price is going to start rising with every year from this point from this point going forward. Now let's talk about let's talk about Ukraine. I mean, what has happened over the last couple of months? may very well have started or have accelerated the disintegration of Ukraine. And I say this with some, you know, I'm not saying this is definitely what's going to happen. I mean, the Americans have been talking about an invasion of Ukraine. The Russians, as I said, have acted in a way that I think is intended to prevent the possibility of escalation of the crisis any further. Let's look at this from a Ukrainian point of view. Let's look at this from the perspective of the families whose sons have been fighting in the Donbass to try and reclaim the Donbass as part of Ukraine's land. I mean, they must know now that's never going to happen. Whatever happens in Russia, whatever economic problems Russia has, Russia's never going to retreat from the position it took yesterday. So that war is now irrefutably lost. Um, all that blood and treasure that Ukraine has expended on it has been for nothing. All those young people who died, 14,000 of them, so you know, according to the official figures, have died in effect for nothing. That is going to create enormous bitterness and enormous um, sorrow. Um, and on top of all of that, it's difficult to see how these events as well as undermining further what is left of the Ukrainian economy. And Putin, again in that speech, gave a long litany of the famous industrial plants and design companies and, that Ukraine had once had when it was part of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, the Antonov Aircraft Design Bureau, the Yuzhnoye uh, Rocket Facility, the Nikolaev Shipyards built by Catherine the Great, all of those things, all of those things are already essentially in a state of collapse and the economy is going to go on collapsing even further. And at the same time, Russian speakers in Ukraine now have further reason to believe that if there's a crisis, Russia will stand behind them. And of course, Putin talked about the events of the Odessa fire and um, the fact that the Russians know who was behind it. Can, can, you, get, can you get into that a little bit? Sorry yeah, this is the, can you get yes. into the Putin's decommunization comment where he was yeah, targeting, I guess, the Banderites and the neo-Nazis? The neo yeah, can yes, can, can you get into what he meant well, by that? I'm going to show you what yeah, decommunization know. really means. Well, I mean, what, what these people... I mean, because, of course, the, there's been this constant talk in Ukraine about purging and cleansing all elements and aspects of communism uh, from Ukraine. And, of course, this is very much the slogan of the far right in Ukraine. It's what right sector has been all about. They've been going around Ukraine, toppling Lenin statues wherever they've been and doing all those kind of things. And, of course, what they won't accept is, and this is the point you... Putin was trying to make to them, is making to them, has made many times actually, is that Ukraine in, in its pre-2014 borders is entirely a construct of the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union who created these borders. And if you want to talk about decommunization 
in Ukraine, that that means logically erasing those borders too, because they are a product of communist, of Soviet power. So that's the point he was making. He said, you want to hold on to that point of the Soviet legacy, which suits you, whilst denying all the rest. And that just doesn't get to work. It's ultimately only going to create more problems for you because you're not prepared to accept the present uh, uh, realities, the multi-ethnic realities of Ukraine. And as a result, by insisting on these present borders, but also insisting on a mono-ethnic, monocultural Ukraine, you are in effect engineering the collapse of Ukraine. And I think the danger now is this is going to accelerate because, to be very clear, this isn't going to improve the internal situation in Ukraine. It's going to get worse, in my opinion. So Russians now understand across Ukraine that if there's a crisis, real crisis, Russia stands behind them. It will look after them. That was something that came across very clearly in the Security Council meeting yesterday. At the same time, Ukrainian nationalists, seeing every part of their project gradually disintegrate, are going to become even more uh, hostile, one would assume, towards Russia's, Russian speakers. And as Ukraine continues to spiral downwards, it's very easy to see how these tensions could start to bubble and blow over and become increasingly, increasingly severe. So this is nowhere near ended. The Russians may be have succeeded in containing this problem to the Donbass this time. But be under no illusions in four, five, six years' time, it's, going to, it's all going to come back. It's all going to come back in renewed, with renewed force. And, of course, by that point, Russia will be even less integrated into the global economy, the Western part of the global economy. It will have even more freedom of action. It will be militarily stronger than it is today. And the Europeans will, of course, be weaker. So that's where all this is heading and looking at Ukraine's future. One has to say the prospects are grim. Can you just touch upon that real quick uh, from an economic standpoint? Uh, the EU gave them like a billion euros, which is not yeah, going to do anything. As I said previously, they lost like 3 billion euros a month what from this. The, uh, they have a court case in London as well that's absolutely. that's pending. Um, I know. Well, we'll see which, what which happens really with that. I'm, yeah, it I would, could yeah. hurt them. I, I, I wouldn't put too much into that. But the, the other thing I was going to say is, of course, after all the you know windy rhetoric coming from Washington, the EU came up with 1 billion euros, which at least is money. The, the US has only offered $1 billion worth of loan guarantees. It's not actually giving Ukraine money. It's just giving loan guarantees. They did that, by the way, the same thing in 2014. The US isn't really helping Ukraine financially. And one of the points that Putin made, again in that speech yesterday, is that if you look at trade turnover figures, Ukraine's trade with Russia before the Maidan crisis was bigger than it is with the EU today. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's just an economy that's continuing to... I mean, EU trade with the EU has not replaced the lost trade from Russia. And it isn't going to. Nor, nor Be, will it ever. Nor, and nor will it ever do. And, of course, what's happened, as I say, is going to make it even more difficult to come up with a coherent political system or structure in Ukraine. And, as I said, it's, the economy is going to continue to spiral downwards. And sooner or later, we're going to get the next crisis. Yeah. Um, is Zelensky in trouble? Is he in yeah, trouble? I, because Zelensky ran on a platform of unifying Ukraine through a peaceful solution, through dialogue, through speaking with the uh, Donbass republics. He didn't do any of that. Is he in trouble? Uh, Ukraine's going to lose 16% of their GDP when yeah. the pipeline transit stops. I mean, this is an absolute train wreck. 
It is a train wreck. And, and, of course, and the U.S. and NATO have pulled out as well. The, the U.S., no, I mean, no. they pulled know, out their offices and their embassies. I know, so I, know I know, I know. They've abandoned. I know, I know. Abandoned. They've abandoned him. I mean, I think what they were doing, and I said this already, I think they were trying to dangle Kiev in front of Putin, hoping that, you know, he would go for Kiev, which, of course, he shows no sign or interest in doing. But that was, I think, what that was all about. But coming to Zelensky, again, it's very difficult to see his position Um with any look, contemplate it with any uh, confidence. I can just say straightforwardly. I mean, he is completely out of his depth. I, I I was reading the other day his speech to the Munich Security Conference, and it was zany. I mean, it was all over the place. It was just a, a jumbled up mess of words. <laughs> it was. I mean, you know, I, I read, and apparently the people who were listening to him there, I mean, you know, they, they gave him a standing ovation, but they were all telling each other, this is demented, or it's not demented, it's, all, it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just totally incoherent. He should, he's not a proper politician. He's not a real leader. And he's certainly not the person to lead this very fractured and disintegrated cri- country through this crisis that in which it finds itself in. I and mean, what Ukraine needs is a sort of... Call Russia. Well, of course it does. <laughs> but, I mean, it needs, but what it needs is a strong, visionary leader who's prepared to do those kind of things. The political system in Ukraine makes it impossible, all but impossible, for such a person ever to appear. Again, Russian Security Council meeting or said as much. They said, you know, that what's now happening in Ukraine is that, you know, the former president is now uh, facing treason charges. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, 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 the political, that you know, one president has, you know, run away, the other is facing treason charges. The present president Poroshenko, is a you mean. clown. Yeah, Poroshenko, the present president is a, is a clown. I mean, it's obvious that the whole situation is um, winding down uh, 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 and becoming catastrophic. Yeah, and when you mean clown, you literally mean... I mean literally a clown, yes. Which is, you know, to be straightforward, a very honourable and great profession. I mean, there have been amazing clowns, professional clowns, but it's not a qualification that, you know, sets you up for uh, the presidency of a country like Ukraine. You want somebody who is, you know, tough, worldly, knows how things work, understands economics, understands business, um, understands how politics happens, has some grasp of military affairs, knows how to conduct foreign policy. Zelensky is none of those things. I mean, he is a, a co- completely out of his depth in this situation. And to be straightforward about this, given this debacle, and it will become increasingly clear that it is a debacle, I mean, his position in Ukraine again um, is at serious risk. A couple of weeks ago, before all this really got underway on in the big, big way that we're seeing at the moment, there was actually talk of a potential coup against him in Kiev. And I would not be surprised if over the next few months, once this um, present crisis has died down, if all that talk was if all that talk resurfaces. In which case, by the way, if that does that happen, would be the end. Well, that would be the end. And I mean, you know, we I talked I said, you know, that there'll be that this crisis is nowhere ended, near close to being ended, but I mean that would bring it forward. Yeah. Uh okay, let's get to some uh, let's get to the questions, the second part. Is yeah. there anything else that you would like to, no, to I, wrap I, it I, up? I, uh, I, I, I think I think I think we have covered this, but can I just say reiterate again the, the continent of Europe, the civilization of Europe has experienced a disaster. It's a calamity. Ever since, and I I have to say this, ever since the Cold War, we've seen this emergence of these parasitic institutions, NATO and the EU. They're sucking the life out of Europe. They're, They're drawing out its culture. They're sucking its economic vitality. And another huge step in that direction has now been taken. Um, I, I, I contemplate the future of this continent of Europe, the place I live, my home, with growing foreboding because a disastrous step has been made, which we will pay a massive price for as the years continue. 
you mean Ukraine as the disastrous step? Absolutely, it's the disastrous step. It was this disastrous step to start to expand the EU coup, into... you mean? The coup in Ukraine. The coup in Ukraine okay. and okay. all that's followed from this. If you, you, European leaders had shown any understanding or vision, they would have given the opportunity, the escape route, the off-ramp that Minsk offered them, the Minsk agreement offered them. And they didn't. They were too narrow-minded, too uh, uh, provincial, too ideological, cowardly. too rigid, too cowardly, and too rigid in the end to do it. And they've doomed Europe to decline. All right. Uh, well said. Okay, let's, uh, let's do some questions. And uh, let's just uh, get through. We've got a lot of questions. So let's get through them <laughs> so one by have. one.